Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's so wonderful to see you all here with us today. And before I start, just thank you all so much for being supporters of the Newark Museum of Art and joining us. And we certainly miss seeing you within the museum, but I'm, I'm glad we can all get together this way every once in a while. It's, it's a, a nice transition, but um, I, I look forward to being back hopefully this summer in the museum. Um, so we're gonna get started right away. Uh, we have Judy Robinson here, a docent who has been with us as a longtime volunteer and a docent for approximately nine years or so. Uh, so welcome Judy. She's going to be giving you a virtual tour of the Tibetan Buddhist altar. And we have volunteer Lori. She is going to do a meditation session following uh, Judy's tour. Uh, Lori has been meditating for over 25 years now, and she studied Mahayana, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Lori, okay, uh, Buddhism in a formal program for 14 years, and she's been teaching meditation since 2007. So welcome, Lori. So happy to have you both, Lori and Judy. And uh, Judy, whenever you'd like to get started, uh, please go ahead. I'll just say right quick, we are gonna save the Q&A for the very end, so following Lori's meditation. So uh, if you have any questions during either presentation, please put them in the chat at the bottom. Um, otherwise, we can take your questions in person uh, following both presentations. All right, so Judy, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thank you, Leland, and good morning, everybody. I am thrilled to have an opportunity to talk with you about the Tibetan Buddhist altar, and I'd like to start with a few questions for you. Did you know that the Nork Museum of Art is what has one of the most extensive and important Tibetan collections in the world? Did you know that we were a leader in Tibetan studies? Did you also know that we were the first museum in America to have an authentic, traditional Tibetan Buddhist altar? How did that come to be? In the next 20 minutes, we're going to go on a journey to learn the story of how we achieved this elevated position within Tibetan studies. We have the next slide. Let's look at a map of Asia and right in the middle is Tibet, probably bigger than most of you may have thought. And the important part of the map that I would like to point out is India to the south and China pretty much surrounding Tibet. Buddhism started in India in 500 BC and 100 years later found its way into becoming a practice within Tibet through the trade route, also through royal marriages. Tibet was part of China until 1912 when Tibet gained its independence. So important for us to keep that in mind as the story unfolds. <clears throat> if your eye would move to the southeastern portion of Tibet, that borders China. This is the Kham region. And it is here that our story begins with Dr. Albert Shelton. Next slide, please, Leland. Dr. Albert Shelton was a physician missionary who went to Tibet in 1904 with his family. He administered to the people giving advice and becoming a trusted member of the Tibetan community. As I mentioned, Tibet gained its independence in 1912. And of course, during his period there in the southeastern region of Tibet, he experienced, was witness to a number of border conflicts. Now, some of you may know that the official Sino-Tibetan conflict or war was in the 30s, 
But this had been ongoing for quite a period. And during that time, a number of monasteries and princely palaces were damaged, leaving a number of sacred ritual objects exposed and in need of safekeeping. Dr. Shelton made a trip back to the United States in 1910. He brought with him a number of these priceless objects which he sold to the North Museum of Art, pardon me, <clears throat> to buy medicines to bring back to Tibet. Thus began the collecting of Tibetan art by the North Museum of Art. <clears throat> pardon me. In 1920, he came back for a second time and brought back priceless, objects such as manuscripts, sculptures, painted wall hangings, and we will look at all of those during the course of this talk. The Newark Museum of Art, in becoming the custodian for these priceless pieces, asked themselves, what shall we do with this vast collection that we seem to be collecting? And so they thought, uh, let us seek guidance and research assistance from local Tibetan uh, lamas and descendants of royal families and other people within the community. And we came up with an idea to create an altar or a sacred space. Next slide. What I want to show you in this next slide is what the very first Tibetan Buddhist altar looked like on the left. It was open to the public in 1935. Thereabouts 1980 or so, a number of you are quite familiar that the Newark Museum took on a major renovation, not only to modernize the space, but also to connect some freestanding buildings on the campus of the Newark Museum of Art. Part of that renovation was to create eight new galleries, including a reinstallation of the Tibetan Buddhist altar. To the right, we see a local Lama who is there in the 1935 space deconsecrating the original altar. By that, I mean he prayed to the objects three times, asking the spirits, the sacred objects, to remove themselves temporarily from the space and to return to the spiritual celestial world called the Pure Land. Parts of the structure were also packed up and put away for the new space. Next slide. This is what the altar looked like as it says 1988-1990. Excuse me, the name underneath the label copy, Punchuk Dorje, was the gentleman who designed and painted the shrine as we know it today. So let's take a closer look by zooming in to the enclosure there. Next slide, please. Make it, uh, Leland. In the center, we have our gilt covered copper Buddha representing the historical Buddha because Buddhism was founded by a live human being who lived in India. And there are certain indications as you look at this space and please allow your eyes to wander because we're gonna look at that niche uh, more closely, including the wall hangings in the back. So to the central Buddha, the highest figure there on that platform sitting on a lotus uh, seat, if you would, 
take a look at his dress. I know we're not as close as perhaps we should be for you to be able to see the details. And his pose, he's sitting in a cross-legged lotus pose with his feet up uh, and facing the sky. He is wearing simple clothing, a one-shouldered monk's robe, very modest. And his hands, you can see, one is touching the earth, which is a position of seeking a witness from the earth for his achievement of enlightenment, and the other hand resting uh, relaxed in his lap. Let's look at that head a moment, and you see a top knot on top of his head. This is an Ushnisha, and it represents spiritual wisdom and his elevated state of enlightenment. You barely can see it, but in the middle of his forehead between his eyes is a third eye, a middle eye, all seeing eye. And he has elongated ears, which are a carryover from his youth when he was raised as a prince in a palace. And as a young man, he wore heavily jeweled earrings that pull those earlobes down. On our left is a statue of the deity of compassion known as Uvalokiteshvara. Eleven-headed, eight-armed figure, a bodhisattva, they are called in Buddhism, and the bodhisattva is very much like a saint in the Catholic religion where you would go to church and you would, for special uh, prayer and blessings, visit a niche with a saint in it, our bodhisattva of Loki Shivara on the, our left is there in support of the Buddha. And to the right is a structure called a stupa, which is a reliquary object and, and symbolizes the death of our historic Buddha in the beginning. And that structure of a stupa is likened to a Christian crucifixion cross. The next slide we go to is going to look at that platform of the chalices, I will call them. And those were brought over by Dr. Albert Shelton. And they contain candles, butter candles, uh, if you will, part of an offering. The next two levels really are all offerings. You see in between those six chalices, a uh, plate of fruit and a white scarf draping over it, which is called a kata. And a kata would be given to honor a person who is visiting or to honor the shrine in the case of a practitioner coming to our beautiful, uh, authentic Tibetan Buddhist altar. On the front, we have a series of bowls that would include water, uh, rice, uh, incense, all things, including the candles, that address the senses. When a practitioner comes into the shrine, he or she arrives with humility and reverence getting ready to practice a devotion, a meditation here in the shrine. And so they would be bringing offerings, water for purification of the body, incense for the smell, flowers for the smell, the candles also uh, reflecting a smell, rice for uh, food, and uh, so forth, uh, paying homage to our uh, Buddhist sacred objects on the top. 
and you see over on the left a bell. So that would be the sense of sound, right, to indicate the start of a practice. Next slide, Leland. The wall hangings that I mentioned. Here is an example of one. It is silk and it is uh, painted. We see in the center the deity of compassion of Velo Ki Shavara, who is the deity of compassion. He is surrounded by halos and lotus blooms. And, and on either side of him, you may remember that structure, that, that sculpture on the left of the Buddha was also of Loki Shivara. And he uh, had 11 heads in the statue <laughs> and eight arms. Here we have one face and four hands, arms. The figures on either side, also Bodhisattva, could be other variations of, of Loki Shivara, uh, avatars, if you will. He has in his hands at the top a pearl necklace and a lotus blossom, and his other two arms are in prayer in front of his heart. A practitioner would come in and pray to a tanka, that's what these wall hangings are known as, uh, for help and guidance in reaching enlightenment, to help them be more compassionate in their life. You see by the label copy, it says silk, brocade, pearl, and coral. We, th we think that the pearls and the coral were ground to create dye to paint uh, the tanka because uh, th this is not a 3D wall painting. And the brocade, as in many tankas, this is a nice simple one, some are much more involved and detailed, uh, acts as a frame around the painting. Next slide, Leland. So you have the major components of the shrine itself, uh, offerings, um, statuary, and so forth. And here we have the columns that you saw in the very first uh, picture that we showed that was a uh, good long view. We'll see a longer one in a minute of the uh, shrine. There are eight columns that lead up to that central altar. And you see how beautifully uh, painted they are, each one identical in design. Um, you see many lotus flowers. The colors that you see, these jewel toned colors, represent the colors of Buddhism. We see blue lotus, we see pink lotus. I'm sure there are white in there as well. And the emblem on the top uh, in gold represents the principles of Buddhism. And I'm sure around the rim of the top of the pillar are, are words that uh, also speak to the practice and the devotion of Buddhism. Next slide. Here you see, you know, four of those paint, painted uh, columns and you see more of a long view of how it would look if you walked into our authentic Tibetan Buddhist uh, altar. The Dalai Lama, His Holiness, uh, the 14th Dalai Lama, visited our uh, shrine three times. The first time was in 1979, and that was to look at what we had set up in 1935. And he was most impressed by the richness of the sacred objects that we had in the shrine. And he was also touched by the fact 
that it had opened to the public in 1935, which was the year of his birth. He came again in uh, 1980-something, um, and last time he visited was 1990, last uh, slide there, Megan, uh, Leland. <laughs> and uh, here he is as he arrived in 1990 to consecrate the altar, to call back the spirits, the deities that had left and been packed away in storage before the renovation was completed and ask them to please return from the Pure Land and carry out their promise to help all those who enter who are willing to achieve enlightenment themselves. He is accompanied by, as you see here, uh, Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is wearing a kata, one of those white uh, scarves, uh, a sign of welcome and honor. And over the shoulder, the right, our right, of uh, the priest and the Dalai Lama right there in between is the artist who painted the beautiful uh, shrine. I thank you for your attention this morning, and I, I hope you've learned a little bit about how we have achieved that title and that recognition on the world stage as being one of the leaders of the Tibetan uh, art collection. Okay, thank you, Judy. Uh, this is Lori speaking. I am your next guide, so to speak. And uh, while I'm just sort of preparing us to go into meditation, uh, we're going to show the 360 view of the gallery space that features the altar. Um, so just enjoy this new feature that we have. It's so exciting. Um, so as Judy said, this is a very inspirational space in the museum. It is a blessed space in the museum, if you will. And we're going to take everything that we've heard and everything that we've taken in with our eyes and our ears, and we're going to use this as a launch point for our meditation today. <clears throat> so in this meditation, I'm going to guide us. Um, if you've never meditated before, please don't worry. Um, your job is just to kind of sit back and relax and enjoy it. Um, if you have meditated before, you kind of have a better sense of what to expect and just, you know, follow along as, as you wish. But in this meditation, what we're going to do is we have the opportunity to sit before the, this altar. Um, we're going to imagine bringing these spirits or Buddhas or positive energy, however we want to imagine it in our mind. Um, imagine that before us. Um, imagine that your screen that you're looking at is a portal that connects you to the Buddhas um, and their positive energy. And, uh, and, and we meet there together. And we can use this meditation as a, as a way to be inspired, to receive inspiration from them. Um, but before we do all that, I want to just take a moment for those of you who are new to meditation, um, just to cover some basics of what to expect and how to meditate. So the first is to just dispel a myth that meditation is about um, uh, removing uh, all thought from your mind, emptying your mind. What we're really doing in meditation is focusing our mind on one thing. And um, I will guide us in that one thing uh, it, uh, in, in the meditation, but you can expect to get distracted. It's very common. It's very usual to be distracted in meditation, even if you're a very... Um, 
dedicated and practiced meditate meditator, you're going to get distracted. So your job is to notice that you've been distracted and then just return back to the focus of the meditation. That's it. No judgment, no thinking, oh, I can't do this. This isn't for me. None of that. Just, oh, I'm distracted. And now I'm going to go back to the meditation and that's it. Keep it really light and simple. And so with that, what you want to do is try to avoid wrestling with your mind, fighting your mind. Oh, I can't do this. This is too hard. And instead, make it more of a dance. You know, oh, okay, my mind is going in off in this direction I don't want it to go into. I'm going to just gently guide it back. Uh, and then we're not fighting with ourselves so much in the meditation. We also can use our breath as an anchor so that we don't stray too far. We don't let our mind stray too far away from that point of that object or the focus of our meditation. And then finally, just enjoy. Meditation is meant to be enjoyable um, and fun. Even though all the, pic the images of the Buddhas have, appear to have very serious looks on their faces, they're actually completely blissed out. <laughs> So, um, so it's okay to have fun when you meditate. So like I said, we're going to meditate on cultivating a heart-to-heart -heart connection with Buddha uh, or whatever image, as I said, works for you. It could be a religious image, a secular image, or a spiritual image. And so we'll begin. Um, we're going to turn off the 360 now. And I think I'm going to be, if you want to make me uh, speaker view, whatever you want. Um, and so we'll begin, we'll take, start with taking a comfortable seat with our back straight and relaxed. Try to remove anything that's going to distract you. If you have a phone nearby, maybe put it on silence. And when you're ready, you can gently close your eyes. Begin by just taking notice of any tension in the body. Try to release that tension. Beginning at the top of the head, we can relax the eyes and the jaw. Release any tension in the shoulders and neck. Allow your arms and hands to be very soft and relaxed in whatever position feels right for your body. Allow all the muscles in the spine to relax. And let go of any clenching in the abdomen. Allow your hips, your legs, and your feet to be in a comfortable posture and relaxed. And take a moment now to take in the comfort of your body. And just stay in the body awareness very gently, moment by moment.
And when you're ready, turn your awareness to the breath, keeping the rhythm of your breathing natural. Just begin to notice the sensation of air as it enters and leaves the nostrils. Notice the cool air as it enters and the warm air as it exits. And abide with your breath very gently, moment by moment. If you notice your mind has wandered, gently bring it back to the breath, abiding with every in-breath and every out-breath, moment by moment. to deepen this meditation a little more. We can imagine any physical sensations, any distracting sounds or worries or concerns. Imagine all of that taking the form of thick smoke that with every out breath we release and disappears far into the distance. With every out breath, we let it go. We can also imagine with every in-breath, 
Buddha is before us, radiating pure love straight into our heart in the form of clear light that enters our heart and spreads throughout our whole body and mind, allowing us to feel very peaceful and loved. Breathing out distractions in the form of thick smoke and breathing in Buddha's love in the form of clear light, very gently, moment by moment. Once again, imagining breathing out distractions in the form of thick smoke that disappears far into the distance and imagining Buddha before you radiating love that enters your heart in the form of clear light, enters your heart and spreads throughout your whole body and mind, allowing you to feel very peaceful and loved Abide with this very gently, moment by moment.
And before we end this meditation, we can take a moment now to thank ourselves for engaging in this practice, coming to this beautiful presentation at the museum today. Notice how we feel now versus how we felt when we first logged on. Give ourselves a little imaginary hug or pat on the back. And finally, in traditional Buddhist meditation practice, we always end with a dedication for world peace. And I am going to use a contribution from our docent, Judy, to do that. You can join me by uh, placing your hands in a prayer position if you wish. May the long time sun shine on you. May all light surround you. May the pure light within you guide your way on. May the long time sun shine on me. May all light surround me. May the pure light within me guide my way on. May the long time sun shine on us. May all light surround us. May the pure light within us guide our way on. Okay, thank you. And when you're ready, you can relax your concentration and slowly open your eyes. Lori, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I had to stop myself from sinking in too far to make sure we were... <laughs> make sure this presentation was still up and running, <laughs> but very much appreciate it. That was incredible. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you before, I haven't meditated before, and I think maybe I should start. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and I'll, I'll look to you for, for guidance with that. And Judy, thank you so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. Um, if Everyone is okay to stick around just for the next few minutes. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. Uh, Judy, if you, if you don't mind answering a few of them, I'll read them. And if anybody does have a question, um, you can just unmute yourself and, and let me know. Okay, but I'll, I'll first start with some of these questions in the chat. All right. So from Robert, what was Dr. Shelton's connection to Newark and the Newark Museum of Art? I don't completely know the relationship, but uh, obviously he must have been from this area. And it must have been the North Museum of Art, a place that he knew. He may have known John Cotton Dana uh, because he was looking for someone to protect and take care of these objects fully. So I, I must feel that with what was entrusted in him to find a safe haven for these sacred objects, that he felt very, very comfortable with the Newark Museum and John Cotton Dana because he was our uh, director at that time. Great All question. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think so, if, I, if I could add to that in that, when he was coming to the States with the objects, um, he met Dr. Crane or Crane on the ship and they became friendly. And I, whether it was a doctor, or Mr. Crane, I don't remember now, was a director of the Newark Museum. And they became friendly, started talking. Uh, Dr. Crane died while they were discussing the giving of the objects to the museum um, and that his widow and family donated the collection to the museum. So the connection was more his meeting Dr. Crane, the trustee on the, uh, or the director on the ship. Uh, and that's how it eventually wound up here. Thank you, Carol. 
And thank you for your presentation. It was very good. Thank you. Yes, there, there are a couple comments here in the chat thanking you so much, Judy, for your presentation and that it was wonderful. Um, we have another question here from Michelle. Uh, is the coda from the Dalai Lama? I think that that uh, kata, you mean the scarf Sorry, that was kata. on the um, <laughs> um, uh, shrine? That too is a good question. Carol, do you know the answer? Well, I, know. I do know that the Dalai Lama did contribute a kata to the museum. Whether that's the one, I, I don't know. Rochelle, did you want to um, unmute yourself and add to it? I haven't given this tour for many years, but that's my recollection that when the Dalai Lama visited, mm -hmm. he donated. Uh, I always said Kota. I don't know if it's Kata or Kota. Ellen? I know. I, I said Kota it's too. Spelled <laughs> K A T A. I thought it was K O T A. Oh. We were it's a, it's kata. pronounced Kata. It's Kata. kata. Yeah. Can I also add that the Dalai Lama did make four, a fourth trip, and I'm very bad at dates, but he did come after the, the trip that you showed the picture mm -hmm. of. In 1990. In 19, yeah. uh, time flies when you're having fun. But he did come an additional time to uh, see the, and they had Tibetan monks doing a sand ma mandala. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. I remember the mandala. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And then they proceeded to the river with it in a long procession yeah. and dumped all the sand in the river because once having been consecrated, it had value as it moved and whatever it touched in the river. Also, um, can I add something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I was just remember, I don't know if you said this, but I think the old altar is under the new one. Yeah. It? They yeah. did. They did store away part of the structure, and they did include it in the renovation because the there is a Tibetan uh, tradition of keeping the old and the new spirits together. Elsa, yes, I remember that it was after 2011 because I was already volunteering, and uh, they were there about five days, and mm -hmm. one day. Um, I happened to uh, be with them uh, for lunch. Uh, they were a group. They didn't speak uh, any English, uh, the, the uh, Buddhist priests that were there. Uh, and I didn't know the real, uh, you know, between women and men with speaking and stuff like that. But I, I couldn't understand uh, what they were saying. But someone explained to me that later, uh, they never talked to me directly because I didn't know uh, any um, Tibetan language. Well, they were, were they from India? Uh, I'm trying to remember because they had gone to, they had, uh, the Dalai Lama had gotten to India. And I'm trying to remember the, the gentlemen that came to do the mandala, if they were from India or Tibet. I'm trying to remember, does anybody remember that? No. They were probably from India because the Dalai Lama escaped from Tibet. And since he was part of that, uh, or came to that meeting, and these were lamas under his, uh, monks under his supervision, whatever the term. Yeah, I, I think that's a brilliant deduction. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm starting to think, I didn't understand a word they were saying anyway. They could have been speaking any language, but I didn't understand it. But I do know that I spent the whole lunch period with them one day. That's and it wonderful. Was after 2011. May I just add as a little kind of fun note, Mary Sue Price was the director. And as a gift to the Dalai Lama when he came to visit, she knit a pair of socks for him out of yak. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I don't think there are that many museum directors who have done that. What a personal gift. <laughs> and I remember they had the luncheon for him when yes. he came that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> I'm learning a lot right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where did right, she well, get yak yarn? <laughs> That you'll have to ask. Ravelry. I know she put me on the website, Ravelry. Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> or Etsy. Right, or Etsy. <laughs> well, I want to say we only have just a few more minutes. Um, so if anyone <clears throat> wants to ask uh, in person a question, I'll take one more and then We'll see how much time I have to answer just a few more here in the chat. I do see there's a question about the source of the butter candles. And that it, was was yak, my... it was yak butter. Thank you, well, I, did, I did see a question about the lotus flowers and what they symbolize. It is a, a, the prime symbol of Buddhism, and it represents the journey to enlightenment and from the mud where lotus flowers spring, there are different stages as one progresses to full enlightenment, and those colors represent, different colors of the lotus represent that path. Um, may I also, because I actually never knew that it was Georgie in the picture, and I thank you for pointing yes. that out. But he was a trained Tibetan Buddhist artist uh, from, you know, had been trained in all the tra traditional things. When he came over here, his background had been in that, and that the, the designs and the colors are all very much prescribed as to what, how, you know, when you when you yes. have an altar. Yes. Yeah. Some other fact that's in my head that Ellen Greenfield might be able to verify is that uh, the colors of the altar are so startling and Tibet is a very barren country and the colors are the colors that are used, I guess, in temples, even though I've never been to one. And they represent the colors of what the Tibetans believe is what heaven would look like. Is that, did I make that up? <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Panchak Dorji taught a class. It was a two part class at the Newark Museum uh, workshop and it, oh, it must've been about 15 years ago. And everything, every line, every color is very specific. There's nothing that's modern or adapted. And supposedly if you went into a temple in Tibet um, years ago, certainly not now, but years ago, that's what you might have seen. It's, uh, he studied for something like five years with monks to learn how to do exactly that. And having taken the class, I can tell you I didn't learn very much. <laughs> so if I could just uh, add something to that, uh, I love how experienced you all are with this hearing, with, with the shine. Um, that the act of painting and doing art, Buddhist art, is a is a meditation practice yeah. in and of itself. It's not mm -hmm. like you know, if you have somebody come and paint your house, they're mm -hmm. going to be playing you know the radio or something. They are deep in meditation when they're engaging in the practice. So, the other thing I would mention that I know was kind of drummed in in our training was that that space is both a sacred and a public space. And that we, when, the last time the Dalai Lama visited, they had cer religious ceremonies in that space and it was sacred. And yet the public is allowed in when they're not using it that way. I seem to remember coming, I think it was probably the 2011, and there were groups who were describing, and it looked like, if I re if my memory is right, there were people there were uh, people praying up in the front area, um, and it I've, I've I've seen this place for decades, so it's it's been a a marvelous thing, and I've always talked about the North Museum and the Tibetan the Tibetan stuff. <laughs>
It, it, it certainly is there for practitioners to uh, come in and uh, contemplate and meditate and and pray it, and and anybody else who chooses to come and visit it is not off limits to anybody. It's a welcoming sacred shrine. Just don't bring any offerings. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> Judy and Lori, thank you so so much and. It was incredible. Um, and it's it's so lovely to see all of you here and, and to actually see your faces. I, I miss you all so much. <laughs> and I, I very much look forward to seeing you in the museum. Um, I also wanna thank Megan, although she did have to go right quick. She was the one that was navigating the 360 view of the Tibetan altar. Um, and we're hoping to integrate more of those 360 views of our galleries in the future. So. Um, look forward to that. I'm excited about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you, Lori, for that meditation. Thank you, Leela. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. And um, just quickly, we do have another one of these member experiences coming up in April on April 13th. It's going to be a virtual tour of the schoolhouse and the fire museum. Yes. So I hope you all join us. Um, you can go to our website to register for that, or you can send me an email if you need any help um, retrieving that link. All right, so I hope everyone has a wonderful day. It's nice and warm and sunny, uh, and I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Bye, everyone.